to have air in uh, the cable. So coaxial cables, they are coming from very skinny size, like, like this on RG174, to the custom-made ones for broadcasting and television from six-inch copper pipe. Now back to this. Noise is always undesired, but we have to fight noise in uh, electronic communications. Natural noise is coming from uh, the galaxies, from the sun. How come? Electromagnetic waves are created and radiated when electrons accelerate. So there is a huge nuclear explosion, like in the sun. In the sun, uh, hydrogen is burning and uh, by uh, fusion it converts to helium. In this process, lots of electrons move around at high velocity. Each time an electron accelerates, the accelerating electron creates alternating electromagnetic fields. So from outer space we have electromagnetic waves coming toward us from the sun, from all of the rest of the galaxies, and they bounce back and forth from planets and from the moon, and they all uh, surround our antennas and we pick up external noise that way. Then again there is thermal noise. Thermal noise is due to metal parts such as copper printed circuit boards, wires, uh, the uh, leads of resistors and capacitors, everything that is made of metals. As the temperature changes, the crystalline lattice starts to vibrate and electrons that they freely flow in the crystalline lattice accelerated by the electric field all the voltage applied across electrons they bump into, into each other and they bump into the ions and this creates thermal noise noise in semiconductors is due to uh, semiconductors doped to be donors and acceptors donors are extra electrons <coughs> and acceptors are extra holes. When a free electron covers a hole, an electron would fall down in a hole. That makes a random recombination noise. So semiconductors, due to their normal functioning, where electrons are lifted up uh, from uh, the valence band into the conduction band, the electrons travel through the crystalline lattice, and then they recombine with holes. This is a noisy process. So in electronic and radio equipment, we have noise created in the semiconductors, thermal noise in the metal parts, and we have uh, noise uh, radiated by the sun and other heavenly bodies. Uh, the totality of such noise components, which they are then radiated, and our antennas would pick, pick them up, are uh, characterized by the operator as a QRN condition. Uh, it's uh, natural noise from outer space. There's man-made noise and interference as well. Man-made noise is caused by sparking electrical contacts, commutating machines, relays, uh, spark uh, plugs in motor vehicles, and uh, each time arcing uh, occurs, there are uh, alternating electromagnetic waves created. Those alternating electromagnetic waves, they induce voltages in all of the metal parts of radio equipment. And those vo voltages, they add up and uh, they cause QRM, a man-made noise. Radar noise is uh, localized. Uh, in uh, the distant past, there were uh, lots of uh, search radars employed. Now the civil aviation moved away from search radars. There only are a few in the country. Instead, the aircraft carries transponders. And those transponders radiate reports back to the control tower. And that's how we know where the aircraft is. We no longer need to send radar pulses and receive the reflection from the aircraft. Uh, search radars are still being used by the military but their use is much reduced now 
but uh, where there is a, a search radar, there is radar noise uh, generated in your ham radio equipment. If you have a, an electronic signal, even something received by your antenna, uh, you put that to the spectrum analyzer, this is something what you see on the spectrum analyzer. A noise floor and individual signals that they stand out. Uh, one up, please. What you see on the spectrum analyzer is reproduced here by uh, by an artist or by a student or by somebody who writes a report. So let's inspect this. Those spikes are signal spikes. They have uh, a magnitude. Spectrum analyzers, they are really calibrated for power. And power is converted to decibel units. But voltage and power, they are uh, in proportion to each other. That's uh, considered those uh, measured in power. If there is a signal, that has this much power and the signal sits on the top of uh, that much noise power then there is naturally a signal to noise ratio that calculates a signal to noise ratio in decibels is 10 times the logarithm of this ratio now we want to measure the signal to noise ratio and suddenly we have a problem the signal we can always turn it off in a laboratory you turn off your generator but the noise that's coming from man-made sources and from, uh, from nature, you just cannot turn that off. So the noise is always there. So to measure signal to noise ratio, you can always measure the noise. But how do you isolate the signal? So therefore, knowing that the noise is, well, at least a few hundred times smaller than the signal, we just accept the error and we do an averaging to everything to noise ratio. So signal plus noise or noise. So this test is taken by turning the signal off altogether, then what you measure is noise only. By turn the signal back on in a laboratory setup and suddenly you have signal but the noise is still there, you cannot get rid of it. So the signal plus noise over the noise is what realistically can be measured uh, in a laboratory. In a radio receiver we use noise limiters. Those noise limiters are very effective in clipping uh, of uh, the tops of the pulses. Noise limitation is used in FM receivers a lot. Uh, in uh, sideband ham radio receivers uh, there is a noise limiter that works somewhat differently. If impulse noise is present, the whole receiver is muted for a very short time, for a millisecond. So when the receiver is muted, the actual signal you were monitoring, you don't hear it. But you don't hear the crackle in the speakers and the fatigue of the operator is, uh, is not the case. So in M radio receivers, we deal with noise by turning the whole receiver on and off and on and off automatically by a noise limiting circuit and you turn the receiver off or mute it for the duration of the noise spike. So most of the time you don't even realize that then you just uh, hear uh, the signal better than if the noise was left in place. One up please. Uh, receivers they do have limitations but the limitations of, uh, of the receiver are uh, that they have uh, a noisy signal, the receiver deals with the noisy signal using a limiter. A noise limiter would clip, clip, clip the top and the bottom uh, of a signal and then uh, what's left is pretty well just the desired signal because noise, particularly man-made noise, could be much larger than the signal. Uh, another limitation of uh, the receiver is the limitation of the sensitivity. Uh, the sensitivity of a receiver is limited by the capability of the receiver to not generate noise by itself. A receiver has metal parts. Every single resistor capacitor inductor has a metal pigtail. The printed circuit board is, is made of copper. And then uh, there are semiconductor parts. So the receiver inherently generates noise and the noise generated by your own receiver limits 
the sensitivity of your own receiver. One up and we will we'll see uh, an illustration I made for this. Uh, up about here please. Uh, good. Suppose we have a signal, this green uh, report is a signal, uh, a date or a dash from a Morse code transmission. And this signal is surrounded by noise. So we have signal power and we have noise power and obviously the ratio of the two would be the signal to noise ratio and this is the signal to noise ratio of the signal that's coming down from the antenna into the receiver. Now the receiver has amplifiers and the amplifiers they really cannot tell the difference. Amplifiers would amplify signal and would amplify noise, everything that goes into them. So you get noise from the antenna, your receivers amplify it. So if you would use a ruler and you can go proportionally up to the top of the blue. So say oh the noise is amplified uh, 20 times in my amplifier. In the same time, the signal is amplified 20 times. So everything is right. Well, unfortunately, everything is not right. Because besides picking up signal surrounded by noise, the receiver is busy making his own noise. And that's what I marked with red. So at the input of the receiver, there's a signal to noise ratio. The signal to noise ratio, say it's 12. The signal is 12 times more powerful than the noise. But then the receiver amplifies this and creates noise of its own. So at the output of the amplifier the signal is big, the noise is big and bigger. So the input could be a signal to noise ratio of 12 and the output the signal to noise ratio is only 10 because the receiver makes its own noise. So the sensitivity of a receiver, it depends really very much of the receiver's noise properties, of how much noise would the receiver generate. So a very golden rule is that a receiver needs a low noise amplifier at the front end. Because at the front end you amplify everything, signal and noise. By the time the signal is amplified and the signal-to-noise ratio is established, at the very end of the receiver, the, in the audio frequency amplifier, it doesn't matter uh, anymore. Because at the input, you have your radio frequency amplifier, and there's several stages of amplification. And from the antenna to the speaker, the receiver may amplify several thousand times. So at the input, any noise picked up or generated, is amplified several thousands of times. But at the end of the receiver chain in the audio amplifier, the audio frequency amplifier, you only amplify the audio, not everything. So one up, please. Uh, another issue with the receiver is its frequency calibration. We had analog readouts in the past and we pretty well uh, gotten away from them. An analog readout was very inaccurate because it even depended at the, from the angle the operator looks at the dial uh, from two different angles there is the parallax error. So it's impossible to really read a, a frequency with very much accuracy. So now today's uh, ham radio receivers they strictly use digital displays. Are they extremely accurate? I want to describe uh, a, a receiver for you. In a receiver there is a synthesizer. That synthesizer is being tuned either by a dial or even from the keyboard or one way or another you tune your radio to pick up a particular signal. Then a microprocessor is involved in this process. The microprocessor is running a program that is telling the phase lock loop synthesizers what division ratios to use to get the signal you desire. So a microprocessor program also drives something like a liquid crystal or an LED display to display the frequency. The display of a ham radio is not a display of a frequency meter. It's a display of a wish. The micro processor wishes to set your radio precisely 
to 14.5 megahertz. Therefore, the microprocessor displays on the display this desire. Okay, I want to do my best to set your radio at 14.5 megahertz. But then, how exact this frequency is, it then depends on many other properties of the quality of the crystal oscillator reference and oscillations in the loop of the phase lock loop and so on. So digital displays are many, many times more accurate than analog readouts. And digital displays themselves, they have built-in errors because the display is generated by uh, a computer or microprocessor program. And it is just, uh, say, a set point or a desire or a wish. And behind it, the synthesizer would do a good job of being very close to it. Up, uh, please. Uh, this unit is called a temperature compensated crystal oscillator. This is a Yesu. Yesu radios, they often use 22.625 megahertz as a standard frequency to amplify all signals received at that frequency. This frequency is called the intermediate frequency. And when you buy your ham radio, then uh, the dealer uh, thinks that you would much rather buy that radio if it costs $1,000. So they pull out all of those extra filters. Now later on you realize, but uh, my radio is not selective enough. So you go back to the dealer, oh, well, give me $150 and I give you this. Temperature composite crystal oscillator and several filters. So this is the world we live in. Uh, M radios are being sold uh, uh, with a basic setup. And to get its frequency stability and selectivity in order, you usually have to buy extras. Or you can buy all that all at once from the beginning, but they end up paying $500 more than just the basic radio. Further up, please. This is a device that often pops up on eBay or uh, Surplus. A 100 kilohertz crystal calibrator was built by the Heathkit company before they went out of business. You can build your own this way. You get hold of a crystal with a round frequency. 100 kilohertz is very good. Uh, you'll uh, drive the 100 kilohertz oscillation through a limiter to create uh, harmonics. And those harmonics are rig rigorously at 100 kilohertz intervals and you can calibrate your radio scale if you see that your radio scale displays something 0.4 kilohertz then uh, the 4 kilohertz extra is probably an error because the crystal calibrator should be right on round numbers so uh, this is a typical ham radio project to build a crystal calibrator further up please how do radio receivers work First was the crystal set. The crystal set in today's terminology is nothing more than a parallel resonant circuit and a diode detector. The parallel resonant circuit has a bell curve, it has selectivity. So you tune a variable capacitor to set the frequency to the desired uh, signal you want to receive. Then the signal is maximum, it increases multiplied by the quality factor of the resonant circuit and your detector diode the model is the maximum voltage and after some filtering you regain the audio a little up please uh, to those diagrams right here what you see is the schematic diagram of the equivalent of a crystal set the crystal set in the past was built on uh, germanium crystals or uh, uh, galenite crystals, well we no longer use that, those are museum pieces. Now a penny would buy you uh, an extremely good uh, germanium radio frequency diode. And that's what you would use in uh, a detector. Uh, this is a radio frequency transformer. The primary is tuned to be a parallel resonance circuit. In the secondary, a diode rectifier would do this. Alternating uh, oscillations modulated in amplitude are rectified. The negative part is neglected 
and the positive part comes out from this diode detector. But this is still a radio frequency, so we only want the envelope. So therefore there is uh, an RC filter. A resistor and a capacitor in parallel has a time constant. The time constant is R times C. And for a radio receiver, you want to set this time constant somewhere to one millisecond in the audio frequency domain. Then the time constant of the RC circuit would do that each pulse charges this capacitor and in between the gap in between the pulses the time constant of this RC circuit does not allow a total discharge. It only allows a partial discharge. So we will get a rugged uh, envelope where by further filtering you pull out the lowest frequency component and this is the audio frequency. Uh, this link here that says AGC stands for automatic gain control. That's a feature of most ham radio that the magnitude of the detected demodulated uh, audio is in proportion with the signal strength of the received signal. So if that signal is very powerful, the automatic gain control circuit will turn the down the gain of your receiver. If the signal is very weak or the voltage here is very small, then the automatic gain control bus would increase the gain of your receiver. Uh, you can overcome this by turning uh, the gain potential with an RF gain up and down by hand. One more please. The super heterodyne receiver. The super heterodyne block diagram was developed by Major Armstrong. He was a, an army captain, later on major, and he developed frequency modulation and uh, FM broadcasting in the United States. But uh, uh, he needed a good receiver, and then uh, the receiver used at the time was the Autodyne, which was a circuit uh, developed uh, by Lee De Forest, uh, the inventor of the vacuum tube. It did not work very well, and Armstrong's uh, block diagram or circuit works so well that we use it today still. A super heterodyne receiver has a radio frequency amplifier that fits a mixer. The mixer is connected to a very stable synthesized local oscillator. What the mixer would do would beat, multiply, multiplication in the time domain to create addition and subtraction in the frequency domain. Uh, usually the subtraction is what you are after. Because if this local oscillator is running at 20 megahertz and you pick up 21 megahertz, the sum would be 41 megahertz, so way too high. But the difference is one megahertz. That's a lower frequency. So we go for the difference of the two signals and a lower frequency filter, give or take one megahertz, even 455 kilohertz is usual, nine megahertz is often used. So you receive a signal at a much higher frequency and by running a local oscillator you subtract from it. And you maintain the lower sideband and you filter it, further amplify it and demodulate it with the demodulator, often called a square law demodulator. Why is it called the square law demodulator? because power is proportional to the square of the voltage and the diode detector has a curved characteristic of the diode in such a way that the output DC is uh, pretty well proportional to the signal power and that is just very convenient for us even for measuring instruments. So this is a square law demodulator followed by an RD amplifier. This equation, you will not see it on the test, but uh, it explains a great deal if you remember it from high school. You multiply cos x by cos y, and you'll get uh, difference and sum. This difference is the lowest frequency, and it is called the intermediate frequency. So when you tune a radio, whatever frequency signal you pick up, that signal is always mixed down to a fixed value of the intermediate frequency. So all of the further processing, filtering, amplification, 
and the modulation is done always at the same frequency. One up, please. Uh, high side injection and low side injection has the meaning whether the local oscillator is higher than the incoming signal or lower than the incoming signal. Both are extremely widely used. Uh, AM radio started with uh, high side in injection for practical reasons. When you transmit at very low frequencies of a few hundred kilohertz, now how can you inject a local oscillator below that? If you transmit on, on 300 kilohertz, your local oscillator cannot go down to 100 kilohertz. So AM radio receivers, they always used high side. The local oscillator was higher. But now ham radio equipment receives real high frequencies, such as 144 megahertz, and there is plenty room underneath it to inject a local oscillator carrier below it. So ham radio equipment at will, at uh, the will of the designer may use high side or low side injection. Further up please. Now we explain the image frequency interference. Simply what the image frequency interference is that a mixer would multiply two signals. But your receiver picks up inherently signals desired and signals undesired. So uh, please bring this up about here to see the numbers underneath. Let's run through this numerical example. Suppose we intend to receive 28 megahertz and we inject 19 megahertz on the low side. 28 minus 19 equals 9 megahertz and 9 megahertz would be the desired intermediate frequency. But well, it's entirely possible that somebody else transmits on 10 megahertz and you really don't want that signal. But this is a powerful radio station and the 10 megahertz penetrates into your mixer. And the mixer already has this 19 megahertz local oscillator set for the desired signal. But the mixer doesn't know any better. It says, oh, two different signals. Boom, I have to multiply them, create some and difference. It just accidentally happens that the difference from 19 to 10 is 9 megahertz. So here is uh, another example. The local oscillator could be 455 kilohertz above and 455 kilohertz below another signal. So I just made up those numerical examples for 1 megahertz because those are own numbers. But the intermediate frequency can be anything. It's uh, standardized to a few values, but there are more non-standard values than standard values. So this is the image frequency interference, that whatever undesired signal there is uh, received, and accidentally that undesired signal is exactly one IF amount away from your local oscillator, then your receiver would pick up two signals at once, or it would pick up the same radio station in two different spots as you dial. So here is the high side injection example again. We want to receive 29 megahertz and the user high side 38 megahertz local oscillator. Then the intermediate frequency 38 minus 29 would be 9 megahertz and this is the desired signal. But 47 megahertz is pretty well the frequency of uh, the first generation patio telephones. And those telephones cause lots of trouble. Look, if 47 megahertz is being transmitted, that beats with your 38 megahertz local oscillator, again creates 9 megahertz, again, so you can't win. There is only one way to win. Make the distance between the local oscillator and the desired signal great, like 60 megahertz or so. This is called up conversion. And we say, well, if the desired signal is 60 megahertz one way, the undesired signal would be another 60 the other way. So by now it's 120 megahertz away. So with all uh, likeliness, my receiver with a good front end filters and so on would just not really pick up something 120 megahertz away. So the best way to defeat image frequencies is the so-called procedural up conversion. We convert signals up above by 60 or 80 megahertz 
so far away from possible interference that the front end of the receiver will uh, not allow interfering signals anymore. This is just the picture of a mechanical filter, as I briefly described it to you. You see coils at either end, and there's a metal rod in between, and any radio frequencies applied to the driver coil would cause the rod... You heard the term magnetostriction before? You see, uh, transformers at 60 Hz, they have laminate, and the laminate vibrate, and they make the typical 60 Hz hum. That's outright vibration. But at higher frequencies, a piece of metal can no longer vibrate. But what the metal is doing is steel. It will increase and decrease its volume. So the crystalline lattice itself vibrates. And that's called magnetostriction. You don't see it, you don't hear it, because it's happening, say, at 1 megahertz. So this rod vibrates by magnetostriction, and the pickup coil at the output uh, would regenerate the signal. So mechanical filters like this one is for 455 megahertz. It's typically used in uh, AM radios and even in FM radios. Okay, one more up. How do we receive FM? Now we have the block diagram of the super heterodyne all introduced. We have a radio frequency amplifier and a mixer and a very stable local oscillator and a filter and the signal is amplified in the intermediate frequency amplifier and we introduce a new twist a stage called the limiter and the limiter is followed not by the square law demodulator this is FM so to demodulate FM uh, the device is called the demodulator or the discriminator so how does this limiter work? well the limiter is often built together in one unit with a frequency discriminator. Over time, the early FM radios, they used faster and silly discriminators. Those were based on parallel resonance circuits, and the property of a parallel resonance circuit to be capacitive above resonance and inductive below resonance. So there was a phase shift created as the FM signal did swing up above and below resonance, and that caused a vector to bounce, and the rate at which that vector bounced was uh, the audio. The faster and silly discriminator was modernized and reissued as the ratio detector. They are just about gone uh, past history now because of manufacturing. Both the ratio detector and the faster and silly discriminator, they use tunable cores and coils. And those are uh, uh, expensive to manufacture and cannot be manufactured with robots. Robots like to manufacture integrated circuits. So lately we have two more detectors. One is the quadrature detector, one is the phase lock loop. A quadrature detector would shift the incoming radio frequency into a sine and a cos format. So now they are at 90 degrees from each other and therefore they are in phase quadrature. And the two phase in quadrature they rock in step with the incoming FM. Uh, this is an integrated circuit that's widely used in today's equipment. And of course the phase lock loop. Remember that the phase lock loop has a reference and a voltage controlled oscillator and a feedback into the phase detector. If you feedback something that is higher or lower in frequency, then the phase detector would output a positive or a negative error signal. And if the signal you feedback is uh, swinging in step with the frequency modulation, then the error signal would hunt up and down in step with the audio. So phase lock loop type integrated circuit uh, Frequency discriminators are widely used today. One up, please. This is an illustration of how the limiter works. There's a signal that picks up lots of noise, so the noise aids and opposes. But when you pass that through a limiter, you shave the top and you shave the bottom because the intelligence is not in the amplitude. It doesn't matter what the amplitude is. It does matter how dense those pulses are. So those pulses, they go further and closer to each other in step with the frequency. 
So this is a great advantage of frequency modulation that you can shave the noise up from the top and from the bottom without altering the intelligence at all. This is just a picture of a typical 10.7 MHz filter. 10.7 MHz is the standard intermediate frequency for most FM receivers. Tiny little filter cost a quarter or so. How do we receive single sideband or CW? Amazingly, the same way. Again, the super heterogeneous receiver has all of the standard blocks and there's no limiter now because in CW, obviously, uh, the intelligence is in the amplitude of, of the pulse. What we have is a new stage called the product detector. Now, why is that so? You transmit CW and you transmit on um, 7.1 megahertz. You detect that with a squirrel lot demodulator. You cut away the negative going pulse. You maintain the positive going end only. And you get direct current from it. So a diode detector cannot demodulate Morse code or single sideband. And the reason is that what's missing there is the carrier. The carrier is missing. So CW does not have a carrier at all, but we create one locally. And the oscillator that creates that missing carrier is called the beat frequency oscillator. So the beat frequency oscillator is set to be anywhere from 500 hertz to 1000 hertz above or below the intermediate frequency. Then the two makes a sum which is ignored and a difference which is say 800 hertz. Now you can demodulate 800 hertz and you hear 800 hertz. So the Morse code receiver has a second local oscillator called the beat frequency oscillator. Amazingly, single sideband needs this beat frequency oscillator because the single sideband signal lost its carrier and the other sideband. So by tuning the receiver, you move the single sideband in a position exactly next to a missing carrier that's not there but you reinsert it locally from the beat frequency oscillator and then you beat. What does beat mean? Multiply. Multiply in the time domain to create, create sum and difference in the frequency domain. Again, the difference is what we are after because the difference is the audio. So you have a 10 megahertz sideband signal and the 10 megahertz less uh, 600 hertz beat frequency oscillator it's not the 20 megahertz component you want that would be the sum the difference is the 600 hertz or 300 hertz or 2 kilohertz those are all possible components so the whole package of audio frequency from 300 hertz to 2500 hertz is demodulated if you reinsert the missing carrier into its location so in single sideband we have a virtual carrier it's not there, but we will stick it there with a the receiver. Okay, one up, please. Peter, they used to have a knob on your uh, receiver for the beat frequency oscillator. Yes, and they used the to. new ones don't have? No, the new, new ones, they have that program. The program is one forever. And then, so I, I have my CW set to 700 hertz, but the next guy would want it at 800. 800 and the next guy was wanted at 600. So there used to be a, a, a dial a knob, but now uh, it's in the setup. Y you can oh, set up oh, pure radio, but you set it up to 600 hertz, there's so much fiddling with programming it that you just leave it like that forever. It. There's no more adjustment. There's no more adjustment. Uh, the adjustment is there, but in, in, the menu. in the menu. Yeah, okay. But uh, in the middle of a contact, you don't want to go through the menu. So you set the... Uh, frequency to what pleases you yes and you'll leave it there uh, uh, mine is set at okay what is a dsp it stands for digital signal processor a digital signal processor has analog to digital converters and then uh, the analog signal which could be an instrumentation signal or physical parameter in the industry or a ham radio signal this ham radio signal is converted 
to bits. And then a microprocessor would manipulate those bits and would apply algorithms of filtering and demodulation to it. So one function of a digital signal processor is analog filtering. So you convert your analog signal to digital. The filter modifies the codes in such a way to reject frequencies above and below you don't want and returns the code through a digital to analog converter that you can hear it again. And all this is a tiny integrated circuit chip. It's extremely difficult to program. It's so difficult that at Sioux College they don't even teach DSPs. We ordered the DSP kit for the laboratory once and a fellow teacher and I spent a couple of years trying to turn it into a laboratory experiment. It was too much trouble. So those DSPs, they are programmed in the factory now. They are just soldered in your receiver. But you can buy aftermarket DSP filters. There's this Canadian amateur VA3AGM that he would give you software that programs the DSP in your sound card and turns the sound card into a programmable filter. One of please. The S meter, S stands for the signal strength meter. S meters, they may be analog or digital, and they have a unique way of uh, dealing with the signal strength of your RF signal you receive from the antenna. One S unit corresponds to four times the power. So each time your S meter changes by one unit, the signal coming down from the antenna did change either up or down fourfold. So the S meter runs from 0 to 9. S1 is the signal strength where the signal to noise ratio at the output is 10 to 1. So any signal with a strength of S1 is just barely matches the sensitivity of your receiver. Suppose you have a pretty good receiver with 0.2 microvolt sensitivity. A weak distance signal of 0.2 microvolts would barely move your S meter to S1. By the time you have a powerful signal that blasts in your speaker, you'll be surprised. Uh, time is up, but let's bring this up a bit and then we are done. You got 10 minutes, don't you? Uh, we use the 10 minutes. You see, the power is voltage squared over R. So each time the power from the antenna increases fourfold, then 10 times the logarithm of 4 is 6 decibel. So the S meter is known to be calibrated in 6 decibel steps and increments. And if uh, the S meter goes all the way to S9, it barely takes 50 picowatt of radio frequency power from the antenna. So remember this, 50 picowatt of power would give you several watts of audio in the speaker. If the signal is even more than that, then the S meter is calibrated in plus 10, 20 and 30 decibel units. If by any chance the S meter points to plus 30, meaning that that the signal from the antenna is 50 picowatts times a thousand, because 30 decibel is 1000 times. Is there anything else at the end, please, see if you lift this up. Oh, the software defined radio. Now I briefly described this to you. A software-defined radio is a radio...